that uh, once we go back and look at God's word in detail, how many of our lives revolve around Christ? That means when you wake up, when I mean, that is, say like, you know what, this is my, my life revolves around God. When I was younger, uh, probably when I was 20 years old, my life was not revolving around God. My life was revolving around some other things. I wake up and do things that were not aligned to God's thinking. And then you start, slowly start moving away from things of the world and start getting attracted to the Lord. And then you start to become nominal believers. Nominal believers are believers who just go to church wherever they feel like going to church. And then they probably listen to God's word or probably have a fellowship or go meet and have good time with fellow brothers but they really if you look at their lives their love is not for the Lord if you go back and look at book of John chapter the last part of John where God is talking Jesus is talking to Peter Peter says do you love me God asks Peter said do you love me and Peter gives a very casual answer he says like Lord you know that I love you but the Lord goes back and asks Peter again the same question do you love me more than these lambs more than this fish Peter gets a little annoyed and he was probably disappointed that Jesus is asking this direct questions that directly expose his heart among the rest of the believers. Probably Jesus is not asking in private, amen? You would have expected these questions to be asked by the Lord in private. But Jesus doesn't really care about your private situation. Jesus directly asks this question so that you would have an opportunity to confess, examine your lives and say, where is my life revolving around? And we see that Peter is a little annoyed and he says like, Lord, you know me, you, love, you know that I, I love you more than these. If the answer was right, Jesus would not have asked the follow-up question, amen? But Jesus goes back and asks and answers the same question again, say like, do you love me? Jesus is expecting unconditional love. <coughs> the love that supersedes everything else on earth. When you see some of the colleagues, she says, you know what, he who loves his mother or brother or father or children more than me is not worthy of. That's a hard teaching, amen? Yeah, when Jesus was teaching, he was teaching that, you know what, if you love anything, anybody more than me, you're not worthy of me. That's a real hard teaching. So that's what, if you go back and examine yourself and ask, Lord, where is my focus? What is my primary purpose? Are you the center of my life? You know, the key is center of my life. And then everything else doesn't revolve around you. See that if you put Jesus as a centerpiece and then everything else surrounds that or revolves around that, then you will be a fruitful man. No doubt about that. You will be a fruitful man. And that if you look at it and you place Jesus in the center and all your activities are surrounding him. That means everything revolves around Christ. Everything. Then you are on the right track. Once Jesus has taken the center spot in my house, in my heart, then I have seen that greater things are starting to happen in my everything that I touch. Everything you touch, everything you invest in, everything you, you work will just continue to just multiply and develop and you would not even re realize how amazingly the Lord works in your life. I truly believe, I truly want everybody to have the same blessing that is in store for being followers of Christ. Amen? For being followers of Christ. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Maybe we'll read Joshua chapter 5 verse 9, 10, 11 and 12. This is a fantastic verse because we see that God has promised this nation of Israel when they were in Egypt to be taken out of Egypt into the promised land. Amen? So we see that God has taken these guys out of Egypt. And we see that was, a, that was a great promise that God already talked to Abraham. That this nation of Israel will be in Egypt and they will come out. We see that the nation of Israel followed the, God, the Passover. Amen. They celebrated the Passover. There was shedding of the blood. There was redemption. The nation of Israel, God saved his people out of. The firstborn were all saved. Is that right? But we see the firstborn of animals and even beasts were all were put to death. Which one is better? Saving is better, amen. 
and the nation of Israel faced saving. Amen? And the nation of Israel had to experience Passover. The Lord said, go ahead and, and celebrate the Passover. A spotless, blemishless lamb would be slain. Amen? A spotless, blemishless lamb would be slain and the blood would be applied on the blood posts. And then the angel of death is going to pass by, look at the door post and see if blood was there, it is going to pass over. Amen? That was the meaning of Passover. So now we see that now 40 years have passed by, the nation of Israel, so many people died. How many people died? Everybody died except Joshua and Caleb. Everybody died in the wilderness. And the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about that this God did this as an example, amen, because of their disobedience, they have disobeyed God. And now we see that now they enter the promised land and Moses does not take them into the promised land, but Joshua carries over, he now is in the promised land. Now in the promised land, they celebrate the Passover back again. So 40 years have passed by, again they celebrate Passover. Just before these verses, we see that this new generation of believers, new generation of people had to go through circumcision. God said, you know what, circumcise everybody, now they are in the promised land and they are going to be circumcised again. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away. Which day? After they got circumcised, we see this day the nation is celebrating the reproach of Egypt has been taken away from them from that day on. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the a month at twilight on the plains of Jericho, they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on that very same day. Verse 12. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that day. We see that the, God has promised that the nation of Israel would, would in, the, in, in the land of Canaan, would celebrate this land of Milk and honey, amen? Land flowing with milk and honey, that is a promised land, amen? So now they enter the promised land and the first thing that we see is the manna stops. And now in all through this 40 years, their expectation was to look up to the heavens, amen? Every day the manna falls, they go pick up the manna and eat food for 6 days. And now when they enter the promised land, after they go through circumcision and that day the Lord says from now on the reproach of the bondage of Egypt has been completely taken away from your lives from now on. Now you are indeed free. Indeed free. You are a free man in a free land. So we see the book of Galatians say that now you are children of the free woman. Amen. Free woman. So now by nature God is expecting us to be the deeds of freedom. The deeds of freedom. If you go forward a, a little bit forward to Joshua chapter 6, you see Joshua chapter 6 is about the city of Jericho. The first obstacle that they come face in the promised land is that the Lord did not give them a free land to go conquer, but He put obstacles in the middle. Amen. So God said, You know what? You're going to go over. I take over this land, you are going to conquer, amen. This new life signifies that on earth, now as you and me as believers in Christ, every day there is a spiritual warfare that you and I should win, amen. We talk about spiritual warfare, I mean on earth now, we see that you as a believer, the resistance or the obstacles that are coming to you from the devil, have to be overthrown, have to be defeated by us, amen. By Christ in us, we will be more than conquerors. This is a spiritual blessing and a spiritual promise that God has given us. Now look what is happening. These guys come in and say they see that the city of Jericho is before them. It seems the city of Jericho at that time was about 4 acres. How many acres? Four. Just 4 acres. And the city of Jericho is fortified. That means it is all with walls. <laughs> Anybody who enters into it cannot go out unless they go through the, unless they open the door. So that was the state of Jericho. But now look, the nation of Israel is around Jericho. They are around Jericho and now God is asking them to go conquer Jericho. In the life of believers, you see there are a lot of obstacles that come into you. The moment you start to walk in the spiritual warfare, you see obstacles start to show up. 
Spiritual warfare is happening outside. Amen. So the Lord wants us to be victorious through this warfare. And now look what is happening there. Right? Jericho, Joshua chapter 6 verse 1. Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So here we see people inside Jericho were terrified and they were all and they, they, they all locked themselves up so that because of the children of Israel was who were around them. They sought physical protection. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty man of warrior. So the Lord says, You know what? I have given Jericho to you. Go take over it. And all through these 40 years, we have seen that though the nation of Israel was walking by, it was God who was doing all the warfare. Amen. God did all the warfare. God just used to do everything. But people needed to be there present to do God's work. Amen. So in our lives too, all New Testament believers, you take one step, the Lord takes ten steps. Amen. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians, you know, we are, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. So we see that Paul says that we are God's fellow. That means if you are God's fellow workers, what it means is God is the source of everything and we are partakers of God's work. Amen. We are God's fellow workers. That means God plays the highest role in our lives. So God goes before. So this nation of Israel was coming back, coming out of Egypt into the promised land and God was doing all the miracles. And now when they come to Jericho, the Jericho is completely locked in. And we see that, that verse uh, 3. You shall march over the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. Thus, this you shall do six days. It's very interesting to see that God is asking people to march over Jericho who are men of men of war. Why was God asking the men of war to march over the city of Jericho? Why was God doing it? Because at the end of the day, God is doing a warfare. Amen. Does there, is there meaning for the men of war? Is there meaning or not? So God said, you know, this men of war are going to do, get ready. Right? You shall march around all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. So God is saying, you know what, all of you men of war go and do the warfare. But guess what? I am going to do the warfare. You are going to just stay. The men of war now, all the, look at this, verse 4, he says, and the seven priests, seven trumpets, seven, the ram horns before the ark. But on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpet. So the God, God's instruction to this city of Jericho, with people to conquer was, six days, you will march over the city once. When you wake up, the men of war, the trumpets, they go blow. Let's go once. There are no talking. Six days you are going to do that. But on the seventh day, we see that God said on the seventh day, you are going to march over it seven times. And at the end, all you are going to do is like shout in the name of the Lord. And then the walls are going to come down. And Joshua, in the hearing of the people, has communicated the exact plan for how the nation of Israel is going to defeat Jericho. They start over, right? Look at this, Joshua 6.10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I, sh I say to you shout, then you shall. Joshua clearly gave instructions. This is what you are going to do. And the nation of Israel exactly followed that. Amen. Exactly followed that. In the land of freedom, the people who are free, once they obey God in exact details of how the Lord asked them to do, if they follow those exactly, then we see blessings come. Amen? Verse 14. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. If you go back and look at why God asked them to march over the city silently for six days, God, why do you think God did ask them to walk over this for six days without opening their mouths? But on the seventh day, God is going to do something different. What is God trying to do here? Six days, all they had to do is like go over, no action, right? 
They just had to go around the city. Six days. Will we follow God? If God asks us to go, you know, do this for like six days, no action from you. Will you go? One day you'll go. The second day something else shows up. Right? Some the third day work shows up. Fourth day you become sick. Or fifth day something else shows up. Sixth day something else shows up. And finally, out of six days, you might just make it like one or two days. And finally, if you put your own account, I can enter and you say, Oh, one day I was there, brother, two days I was there, three days I was missing, four days I was there. You see that six days, God asked them to just go around the city, doing no talking, nothing, just go circling. Six days they did, exactly to the detail. Six days they walked around, no issues. Amen? Seven days, the Lord said, you're going to walk seven times. They exactly did that. After the seventh walk, they all shouted in the name of the Lord and the walls of Jericho came down. Amen? So by obedience, we have seen that the walls of Jericho came. So there was no action these guys had to do. The only action they had to do was, was obedience. I was watching in this new land, in this promised land, in this land of freedom, now they have taken them from darkness into marvelous land, from bondage into freedom. I am going to try out and see if these guys are patient enough to listen to my commandments, to follow my commandments to the exact detail. We add something, we subtract something, we add something, we subtract something. That is how our lives are revolving around Christ. The Lord said, you know, if you just follow him exactly to the detail, you don't have to worry about anything. Amen? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. 100% true because that is not an option. So it doesn't say, you know what, you seek everything else and sometimes you seek me. I'm okay, I can add myself, I can put myself into the mix. You know, but the other things are also important. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord, once he came down into this world, he said, I'm not like everybody else. I am the only way. I am not one of the ways. I am the only way. He brings exclusion. He only says, I am the way. You have to come only through me. Nobody else says that, you know. Only through me you can be in heaven. If you don't have me, you don't have my father. If you don't have my father, then you are not going to be in heaven. Did the Lord simplify life or did the Lord make it complicated? God said, you know what, you don't have to search everything. You don't have to go after everything. You know, I'm going to simplify everything. I am the way, you just follow me. If you follow that way, that way is a narrow way. Amen. You'll have to make a lot of sacrifices when you're going in a narrow way. Suppose if you want to go in a point A to point B in a car in India, or probably a car here, you know what you would do? You would pack all this stuff. Is that right? So much stuff will get into the car just because you're taking a car. But imagine they say that, you know what, we're not going in a car, we're going in a, in a, in a plane. And you have to pay for every baggage you take. Nowadays, even in smaller planes, if you have to go from point A to point B, you have to pay $100 or something for each bag. Is that right? Now, the bags that were, the stuff that was at one point of time important, now that you have to pay, people are not carrying. But said, you know what, I'm going to remove all the junk out of you. I'm going to make your life simple. Narrow way is always, you, can, you can't have too much baggage with you in the narrow way. The nation of Israel come there, seven days, God asked them to go through this city of Jericho. The seventh day, seven times, shout, walls of Jericho will come down. And indeed, that has happened. Amen? So we see the point of the victory that, the, that Jericho has been conquered by the nation of Israel. Amen? And now look what happens post that. If you go forward to Joshua chapter 6, verse 18. Joshua 6, 18. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take off the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. And now, as part of the blessings, we see that commandments are also behind blessings. So God said, if you do this, I will do this, but you should follow this in the right way. And not just circling this seven times, but also, once you become victorious, what you're going to do is you're not going to touch anything that is cursed. Only the silver, the gold, and the other things, you can keep it for the tabernacle of the Lord. Look at that. Verse 19. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron and consecrated to the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. That's what the Lord said. Commandments of the Lord. 
simple commandments. Amen? Said, you know what you're going to be victorious? And once you become victorious, this is what you're going to do. What you're going to do? Silver and gold and bronze and iron, you're going to take it and put it in the treasury of the Lord. You're not going to take anything for yourself. What you're going to do is like, you're going to be victorious. I am going to give you the victory, but you're not going to touch anything. Everything that is there, you're going to put it in the, in the sanctuary. And they see that victory has come. Post victory, the nation of Israel was supposed to go and collect this gold and put it in the Go to Joshua chapter 7. Verse 2. Now Joshua sent messages from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the eve, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out of the country on, on, out of the country. So they went out and spied out Ai. So the second city that the nation of Israel is encountering is the city of Ai. A I. So now they got victory, and now they are going to go to the city of Ai to conquer that. And they send out spies into the land. We see the nation of Jericho, the city of Jericho was also spied, and that's how Rahab was you know, identified through that. She was the source. She, she sends them back, the spies back, protects them and sends them back. Now I comes, AI. And we see that Joshua sends them to spy. They spy and come back and give a report back. Say that, you know, this is a small city. We don't have to worry about the small city. Small city, we can be victorious. We don't even need so many people. Let's just trim down the number of resources that we're going to take them. Few people are enough. So they find few people. Look at that. Joshua chapter 7 verse. Uh, three and they returned to Joshua and said to him, "Do not let all the people go up. Let about two hundred, two to three thousand men go up and attack I. Do not weary all the people. Therefore, the people of I are few. So they pick a few number and two or three thousand men, and they want to go. But look what happens there. And the men of I struck down about thirty-six men for they cashed." For they chased them from before the gates as far as Sebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So now they go to attack but on the contrary the small bunch of people are now attacking the nation of Israel. Can you believe that? Now they go and want to attack I but now I is attacking them. And now they were surprised. These children of Israel in the promised land are now facing a little city called Ai. And that little city of Ai is now threatening the existence of a big nation which God is leading. And then they were surprised because the nation, the city of Jericho was very powerful. They brought it down by, by the power of God. But now this small city is now driving these guys back. And we see that Joshua goes and asks God, God, why am I defeated? Why, why am I starting to get defeated? And we see verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up, why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they, have eaten, for they have even taken some of their cruel things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own staff. What did the nation of Israel do? They have. The Lord said, don't take anything for yourself. Is that right? But these guys went ahead, took some stuff from the spoils of Jericho. And bring it in and keep it in their own tents. Not everybody did it. How many, how many did that? One guy did that. So one guy did that. And now because of one guy, 36 people died. Can you believe that? And now we see that the Lord said, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to come into your presence. I'm going to find out the guys who did that. And finally we see the Lord coming and bringing the nation, the tribe of Judah. In the tribe of Judah, the Lord starts to separate. Eventually, it end, ends up at a man called A-C-H-A-N. 
And Joshua comes and asks that man, look at this, verse 19. Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. Tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. God said to Joshua, what has actually exactly happened? Amen. That somebody in the nation of Israel has come in and what did they do? They disobeyed God. So they disobeyed God's commandment. God said, you know what? I'm going to show you who the whatever you do in dark will now come to light. People thought, you know, nobody's going to see this. This guy thought, thought that nobody will see this sin. Is that right or wrong? He stole it, kept it in his, in his pocket and then from the pocket he transferred, nobody was watching. He just dug a hole and then put the gold and silver underneath that and said, you know, nobody's going to know this. Somebody was watching this. Defeat is now coming in. And now when defeat is coming in, then they started to go and re-examine their lives. And then they said that, you know, what is happening in my life? Why am I defeated? Why am I not conquered? Why am I just being there? Small guys are now defeating me. Small, small things are defeating me. What happens? The Lord finds these people and along with his people, all his family is now found. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And they are there hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. There it was hidden in his tent with the silver and red. And they took from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israel with him took Achan, the son of Jerob, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones and they buried, with, buried them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones. Still there to this day, so that the Lord turned from the furnace of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. So what did the nation of Israel do? They faced a small city of Ai and they committed sin as a result of that they were defeated. You know what sin can do to our lives is amazing. You know it's small things. What these guys did was they went and brought in a a garment which was pretty beautiful. If this guy liked the garment, he stole the garment. He liked the silver. He said, like, nobody is watching me. He took the silver, kept it inside. He put a gold of 50 shackles or something. Brought it, hid it under his own. The, Old Testament, the New Testament talks about a man called Judas Iscariot. Who was counted, who was counted, numbered, along with the disciples. And he lusted after physical things. He said, you know what, nobody is going to watch over me, I am going to take this, you know, who makes a treaty with the chief priests and take some money, 30 shekels of silver, brings it and then betrays Jesus. The tragedy for Judas Iscariot is he betrays Jesus. That means he was accounted for, he's part of the numbers, but then he gave up.